Isles Bar Heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for mornings like this that we're able to gather together to break bread, the very bread of life, the truth that sets us free, Father. What an incredible privilege it is to be here, to fellowship this way with each other, to be encouraged as we're all washed over by the word of truth. Father, we pray for those in the congregation that aren't here for a variety of reasons that you return them to the fold in your timing, of course. We pray also for those that are still lost in this world without hope, that they be humbled and receive saving faith before it's too late, Father. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make times like this a time to rejoice, sit back, relax, enjoy. Father, we're just so grateful for all that you do. We just ask for blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. All right, part 124, the book of Hebrews. This message is uh, it's long enough, so you know I would say pace yourself. Uh, we've got to get through it because uh, these kinds of messages require not just concentration, but sort of elongated concentration. Um, but to start with, this week's blog was a gift. Hopefully you read it. And uh, I was thinking about this, you know, why does he, in retrospect, I write these blogs, I think I wrote that blog oh. middle of the week, maybe. Um, why does he have me write those kinds of blogs? And that blog was titled Mama and her 10 chicks. It was a, basically a story of how I looked out my window when I was working and a mama turkey walked by. And I'm not really fond of turkeys because of the stuff they do in my yard and they're always in the street and they're, you know. But anyways, he gave me that moment to sort of set me back on my heels and just sort of respect them as creatures uh, see the beauty <clears throat> that creatures bring to us and remember that those poor little buggers are in pain and suffering because of us from the fall all the way back in the fall in the garden and I was thinking about how we don't think that way even as Christians as we ought to and that we're quote users of nature we just walk through this you know we just walk through this world and we just take whatever we want. I mean, I, I don't understand how people litter, but you, you get the scene, right? People throwing stuff out their car windows, like cigarette butts and, and uh, trash. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, honestly, what, what's going on? You disrespect God's earth that much where you think you can just, like, litter it? And all, I don't know. So we're just users of nature. And yet nature speaks certain truths to us. But if we're fair and honest, we're too occupied, too preoccupied with ourselves, stuck in our own biases even towards others, and we miss all the beauty that's around us. That was kind of the reason for the blog. For example, when I saw the mama turkey with her chicks this week, the spirit convicted me of my own biases. Like, what do I have against this poor little turkey? What did it ever do? Right? And then I wrote the blog, and he asked us all to elevate the lesson to include people. Because biases are very strong. And we all have them, whether we you know, agree to that statement or not, isn't really, doesn't really matter, because we all have biases. And those biases come into play when we observe and experience life. So a quote from this week's blog is, Maybe there are profound moments of clarity that I might experience by dropping my biases towards the people I dislike the most. Maybe there's a reason why God created us so differently, yet exactly as he purposed. Maybe a turkey can teach me something if my heart is open to it. Dare I say, it may even teach me a little bit about love. 
Speaking of love, another excerpt from that blog, the most beautiful thing I know is love. Love is indiscriminate. It is unbiased in its purest form. It is willing to see past the things that irritate me. It desires a virtuous relationship with others, an open, honest, respectful one. Yeah, I got all that from a sort of a little short interlude through a window pane with a turkey and her chicks. That stuff can happen if you're open to it. If you've ever taught prep school, you know what I'm talking about. Kids sometimes are the greatest teachers of all, if you're paying attention. I'll read some feedback, though, I got on this blog for encouragement's sake. Quote, I love that you voiced nature's perspective. Everyone complains about animals in their poop. It astounds me. If we did not have the luxuries we have, our poop would be out there too. What are they supposed to do? We have destroyed their natural habitat. Humans are so self-centered and self-absorbed. I loved the reminder that we need to apply this outwards perspective to people as well. My scales of compassion and such tip heavily towards animals, so it was a gentle reminder that humans deserve that as well. Maybe not, quote, deserve, but we are commanded to love anyway. So that's a good way to think about that blog, right? Kind of like a who are we to complain. Personally, I love blogs like this one because they are simple but striking. And striking in the sense that it's like an, I don't know, an aha moment where God says, summarizing here in my own head, why are you making life so complicated, Ed? Uh, most of you could probably stop right there, and that could be today's message. Why are you making life so complicated? What's the problem? Like, for real. And what do you have that God didn't give to you? Why are you making life so complicated? It's not. Look around. There's so much beauty that God has placed before you. So don't miss it. Be encouraged. Remember where your life is leading you. Write to God in heaven for all of eternity. Now go smile. Some of you, I don't know the last time I saw you smile. It's like pulling teeth just to try to get you to smile. If you're in that condition, there's something seriously wrong. And it's really just perspective. You kind of lost, I don't know, like, there's nothing to smile about? Like, for real? <laughs> like, you can't be happy for one moment? You're that miserable? What is wrong with you? Like, seriously, what's wrong with that picture? When there's so much beauty, when God decided to save you, that alone should make you smile forever and ever and ever. Amen? Why don't you? Honestly, like, it's, it's that simple. It's not difficult. It's not rocket science. This whole thing that we're learning about, right? Although it seems complicated when you get into the nitty-gritty like we're going to do this morning, focus on little Greek words and... That's just building blocks to get to the simple, the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ, right? At the end of the day, it's actually very simple. This is all very simple. All you can do is go outside, breathe that air, look up at the puffy clouds, and say, are you kidding me right now? I haven't smiled in a week, and all this is here? What do I have to complain about? So it's simple, isn't it? Life is good. Just, I don't know, tattoo that on your arm instead of your lament about how much you have to persevere or suffer or whatever you're moaning and groaning about, right? Oh, you don't understand in my life and this person let me down and that person let me down and this person is like a jerk and that person, my boss is an ass, and excuse my French, but, right? So, what do you think you are? You think you're all roses? 
I manage people now. People are a pain in my butt. Like, for real. You try managing a bunch of people. And the smarter they are, sometimes it's the harder it is. People are a pain, so just look in the mirror. You're not so easy either. Well, you haven't met my wife. You haven't met my husband. Look in the mirror. What have you done to them over the years? For real. What have you done to your kids? Kids, what have you done to your parents? Have you forgotten? Like, what have we done to everybody in our lives, and yet somehow we're offended to the point where we can't smile anymore? Let it go. Like, literally, just let it go. Life is too short. Like, but it's just good. Can I get some kind of an amen? Right. Why, is it, why do we complicate it? I don't know. You have to answer that for yourself. Speaking of simple, from last week's message, a lot on uh, fighting the good fight, if you recall. The best fights in this life are fought for others. How's that for simple? Sometimes that's the simplest strategy you've got. If your life is too, quote, complicated at the moment, then stop trying to solve your problems with your own wit and analysis and focus on others. When you drop your biases and see their beauty, it makes such a prospect a lot easier to boot. I don't really want to focus on others because people are, you know, jerks. Maybe they are. Maybe we all are. That's your, that's your conclusion in life? Since everybody's a jerk, everybody's a sinner, then there's no reason to smile at all. There's no reason to get past it. There's no reason to see the good in this life when it's bountiful, says God. Life is too short to live it all bunched and bound up with biases anxieties, depression, and so on and so forth. For real. It's too short. What are you doing to yourself? Go to Psalm 37.3. Psalm 37.3. It's just too short. I just don't want to look back in my life and say, man, you blew it. <laughs> like, you blew it. You're 50. I'm 55 now. If I were to die tomorrow, you know, I'd know that I was going to die in a moment. I would not want to reflect in that moment on my life and go, dude, you blew it. You had 55 years and you wasted it. On what? Being a miserable wretch? After the Lord saved you? What a waste. Right? What a waste. (laughs) This unbelievable opportunity to just, I don't know, how about just be happy? Why don't you just start there? How about be happy, spread a little happiness? Trust me, there's enough misery in this life. We don't need more of your misery piled on. And like I said maybe a couple of weeks ago, right? Like, it's your job to be excellent as a Christian. You're not being excellent as a Christian, bleeding all over everybody, moaning and groaning, lamenting, complaining, the whole nine yards. Bringing up people's past, bringing up your own past, bringing up all the past and saying, this is why I have the right to be miserable. You don't. You really don't. That's the point. And that's what he's been saying to me too. Like I've been having several epiphanies lately. For years and years now, it goes to show that I'm far from perfect. Even though I'm up here teaching, it's fine. But for years and years, I was miserable about certain things, like in bondage, almost guilt-ridden, as if I had too much fun or too much joy in my life, I was no longer being like Christ, you see. I'm supposed to be miserable. No, no, that's taking that out of context and out of range. Yeah, the Bible says we're going to suffer just like Christ suffered. But I find it, I'm hard-pressed to think that Jesus Christ didn't have a certain happiness and contentment in his life. And when he was building furniture, or whatever he did as a carpenter, was he miserable because someone gave him, I don't know, some money to do that job? Did he feel guilty? Honestly. Because that's what I've been struggling with. 
It's not just about work stuff. In general, do I have the right to be truly happy? I mean deeply fulfilled and content and happy even now? And the answer is yes. So even I've been missing something. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of feeling guilty about having joy in my life. And you may say, really? I'm, yes, really. Being a pastor is hard work. Seeing other people bleed and watching other people like slow motion car wrecks makes it very difficult if you have any sensitivity, which I believe he gives pastors a ton of, to the human condition. It's very difficult to smile knowing that the people that you love are in misery. Whether it's their fault or not, which typically it is, as I just described in the last 10 minutes, because it's a perspective issue, doesn't matter. Some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I get it. Because I know that you don't have any know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I can tell by the way you are. Some of you don't care about other people at all, basically. And that's between you and the Lord. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying that there's certain bondage out there that we all got to shake free of. Psalm 37.3 starts with this, right? Trust in the who? The Lord. Just trust Him. And do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Can you imagine that? I'm okay with that then. Delight yourself in the Lord. That I can live with. That is absolutely true. Me personally, I was missing the second. I was feeling guilty about the second half of that statement. And He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Don't worry about those people. You focus on what God has done with you, what you're able to do for others, let's say, the grace that's in your life. Don't worry about other people. And that goes in both directions. Right? If you happen to be prospering even as compared to others, you shouldn't be looking over the fence then either and feeling guilty because God is prospering you. Does that make sense? It's a two-way street. We all reap what we sow. Does this make sense? Am I making sense? Right. Yeah, I'm not getting much feedback. Right? Don't feel bad or guilty or anything about the life that God has given you. If you've got a bazillion kids, hey, do yourself a favor. Enjoy them. They grow up fast. If you don't have any kids, do yourself a favor. Enjoy that life too, because that's what God had in store for you. And stop, being, stop lamenting about having one or the other. Well, I got too many kids. No. <laughs> I never got any. What are you doing? I like for real, right? That's the God, that's the life God gave you. Don't feel guilty about it at all. Don't feel like something's wrong because it doesn't look like your neighbor. Sometimes your neighbor's richer than you, sometimes they're poorer than you, sometimes they're more popular, sometimes they're less popular, sometimes they're more, whatever. You're missing the point. Can you just be happy for a moment? Put a smile on your face, for real. For once, this week, put a stinking smile on your face. There's enough misery in this world. We're supposed to be excellent. Don't we have a lot to be grateful for? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Why are you smiling then? I'm not saying like, oh, we put a fake smile. <laughs> I'm talking about the inner light that comes out as countenance. The rest of us can see it. And here's the beautiful thing. You have, you ready, today to make this change. 
you know what? Tomorrow, in the history of anyone's life, tomorrow has never been guaranteed. Do you realize that? You could be gone tomorrow. So today is the day to make the change. You have this moment right now to make a change. It's usually just a perspective issue. Go to Psalm 55, 22. Psalm 55, 22. These are the things that he's been teaching me, folks. Right? Psalm 55, 22. Some of you have unforgiving hearts. Um, some of you have memories that stretch too long into the past. Uh, some of you have problems like I have where, you know, you're feeling guilty about being happy. 55 years old, dedicating my life to the Lord for years and years now, for your sake, for his sake. And I should feel guilty about having peace and contentment in my life. Something wrong, Ed. Doesn't mean I have to be complacent and stop doing my job here. That's a different story. But when it comes to me personally... Should I be stifling, squashing the things that he wants to give me in my own life? No. That's disgusting. It's disgraceful. The kingdom of darkness loves it. Verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. In other words, be all in. You cast your burdens on him, it's freedom. You let God worry about your problems and let him work through you to help others who may be struggling and or suffering. That's the economy of grace. Remember? goes round and round and doesn't function so well if all the individual links in the circle decide to hoard God's grace for themselves. In God's economy, we share His grace with others. In essence, we become the hand of God in the lives of others. And as a side note, please don't make the grave mistake of thinking to be the hand of God you must look or act like a street preacher or a guy like me standing behind a pulpit or anything so-called religious or religious looking. Remember all the lessons the Holy Spirit taught us about being you, living your life to God's glory. You don't need to be an ascetic to be pleasing to God. You don't need, in my case, you don't need to be, feel guilty about being happy so you can somehow pretend to be more like Christ. That's not even pleasing to God. He's trying to give you something and you're rejecting it in essence. He's trying to show you how much he loves you and cares for you and you're rejecting it on the notion of what? Religiosity. Some self-imposed asceticism. I must uh, reject happiness hmm. I'm not seeing how that's Christ like at all you're not somehow less holy because you don't express your love for others the way I don't know say more public spiritual gifts do I have my notes here you do you I can't remember if I had a special on that, but I know that came up maybe a year or so ago, full force. You do you, and you let everybody else do them. All right, let's get back to our primary course of study. A lot to say on the coattails of a turkey and a mama chick, or a mama and a turkey and a chick, right? If, listen, if you're paying attention, if you open your eyes, it's all right there. Right? You want to stay in your little world and be a miserable wretch? Well, 
I don't know what to tell you. That's your choice. That's what I can tell you. You have the right to be happy. There's nothing in Holy Scripture that says you don't. In fact, it's the exact opposite. You have every right to be happy. Yeah, life's hard sometimes. I'm going to go to work tomorrow. I got people above me, people below me. You got maybe going to work, maybe you go, you know, go back home. Like Pat has to go home with John and his John. Right? He's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta res- the Bible says I gotta respect this guy. Have you seen him, Lord? That's life. So what? Even if John, John's a sweetheart. Even if John was a jackass, Pat should be able to say, I still have the Lord. That's it. John's not going to take my happiness from me. I know he's my husband. I got to live with him. But even if he was a jackass, he's not taking my joy from me, because that's a gift from God, and he doesn't have the right to take it. How much more intimate does it get than marriage? Just saying. That's what the Bible has to say. Go back, let's see, Hebrews 6.4. Hebrews 6.4. A primary course of study. Just remember that. You have the right to be happy, people. Hebrews 6.4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. Our working framework has been, it is impossible to restore some category of a person, a who, And there are two cases, one explicitly stated, one implied, that help us discern who is impossible to restore. And that's what we've been studying out. We've been investigating, who's this who? Who's this type of person that the writer is pointing at, right? We identified five descriptions as they're laid out. One's been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. This type of person is called an apostate. So there's a name for this person. And the qualifying statement, of course, is to be an apostate, there are very specific conditions that must be met first. Not every unbeliever is an apostate, in other words. There are special conditions that must be met for a person to be deemed an apostate, biblically speaking, right? The first of the five descriptors was enlightenment, which implies some form of truth being made evident in the soul of a person, and exposure of sorts, to think in terms of photography. We borrowed from some decade-old friends. I'm going quickly because these are all points of review. Point number one that we borrowed, whether or not a person accepts the truth, never changes the truth. Truth is truth, number two. Truth is truth, and once it's set before a person, they are responsible to it in the eyes of God. So there's this truth, this rock, this immovable thing called truth. Right? And it doesn't change just because someone chooses to accept it or not. Regarding the main person in the book of Hebrews, we can apply this line of thought as follows. The light of Christ explains the absolute truth about all things, the way God sees them, whether said revelation exposes the good, the bad, or the ugly. See? So the truth is set before us, and then we have an opportunity to accept it or reject it. But the truth never moves. I know the world wants to morph the truth, slide the truth a little bit to the left, or slide the truth a little bit to the right to maybe shoehorn more people into heaven. I don't know. 
including themselves. But that's an impossibility. That's what the Bible teaches. The truth is the truth. There's only one way to heaven, folks. It's through Christ. And he don't move. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the rock, capital R. Right? His truth is immutable. It means it never changes. We pulled from Paul's language in Ephesians 5, 13 to 14, but when anything exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. That's that catchphrase that I like to use. You see it all as truth. That's what the truth is meant to do. doesn't get you all the way there because you're also involved in it. You can all, always say, yeah, I put this here. Hey, hey you guys see Burt's Bees? And some of you can be morons and go, I don't see it. It doesn't change the fact that that's Burt's Bees sitting there in the middle of us. Well, some people can say, I, I, I refuse to accept it. Now, as is always the case when we are given the truth about something, again, people can reject the light even when it shines on them. That was enlightened. The second was tasted the heavenly gift. Now, as a friendly reminder, we must think about all aspects of apostasy or the apostate as an all or nothing list. So it's not just someone who's been enlightened, but it's also someone who's tasted and so on and so forth. So again, we're trying to build a picture of this very specific person who falls in the camp of unbelievers, but it's only a subset of unbelievers, right? Called apostates. These people have sort of, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but you know what I'm saying, been in the light, like spent some time in full disclosure, tasted it, been enlightened by it, and then said, I'm going back here. There's a lot of people in the unbeliever camp that don't do that. Now, again, all or nothing list. In context here, we learn that tasting the heavenly gift means two things. They tasted the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've spent enough time with it to experience it, although ultimately they reject what they taste. Now remember, the, as the analogy goes, tasting is different than eating. Right? Tasting, that's what, I mean, sometimes you see people go back there, even a very small setup back there after service, and someone might, you know, grab a grape or something, pop it in their mouth, and like, ooh, this one has seeds. And that's it. They walk away. They taste it, but they don't, they don't, they're not there to sup, really. They're not really there to dine. They may take a little spoonful of the egg stuff and say, ooh, this has, oh no, this has the red peppers, not the green ones like I like, right? I don't like this. So then they don't eat it. So there's a difference between tasting something and eating it. Same goes with the truth. A person can hear the gospel and reject it. They taste, but they don't eat. That's why even, um, think about, I mean, this whole thing is the good news, right? This all points to Jesus Christ. You're all here. Some of you have been in the Word of God for decades. And you're still learning about, guess what? You ready? Of the gospel. You're dining at this point. Someone can taste it and reject it. You spend your whole life after you're saved learning more and eating and dining. I pray this way, right? The very bread of life. We dine on it when we read this book. That's the whole concept that we're come to sup, right, together. We eat this meal together. What's the meal? The gospel. We keep on eating it until we die, and then we get, go to, get to ask Jesus about it directly. And keep on learning. But a person can hear the gospel and reject it taste it and not eat. This is often the person, again, who has attended a biblical church like ours and then left, having been enlightened by the truth and also tasted it. 
John spoke about these types of people, in the context here is, is he's also referring to teachers specifically, but hold your thumb there, go to 1 John 2.18. 1 John 2.18 So don't be surprised that there are people that we've all known, because most of you in here have been here for a while. We've all known people that have sat in your, the same seats you're sitting in, maybe in different parts of this room, and now they're not here anymore, and they're not going anywhere, and they don't care about the Word of God really at all. They've denounced Christ. They've heard the truth. They may have even made a profession Maybe even they got baptized. And they're gone. 1 John 2.18 Children, this is the Apostle John. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. In other words, they were with us, but they were never of us. Right? They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So never be surprised. But, and I'm going to keep going here because there's some warnings here. So keep, let's keep thinking about this. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Christ, or Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. And this was what was going on in context here. There were false teachers trying to upset the congregation who left the congregation, who left the faith, and started teaching another gospel from another spirit. They started in the right group, in the right vein of thought, but they've since defected. Who, he who denies the Father and the Son, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So hold that thought, because I'm going to get back to it in a moment. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it's taught you, abide in him. So back to the hold that thought point. I wanted to read the rest of the, that passage to highlight another feature of living this life on earth. And feel free to take our own congregation as an example. Namely, that it is quite often the case where when people leave a church, they tend to reach back into the church from which they left and poach remaining members from the congregation for the kingdom of darkness. I'm not talking about people that leave and go to other Orthodox churches. I'm not talking about those people. I always wish them well. You go where the Spirit calls you. Just please, just keep learning the Word of God. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about people that leave the faith, who apostatize, and then try to drag others away with them, typically leveraging personal relationships. That's what I'm talking about. John knew this also, which is why he wrote what he was writing. And so warned his audiences of the same thing. So as a principle, let me give you this. Beware of those who claim to have found better news. The gospel is the good news. Beware of those who claim to have found 
better news than the one Jesus preached. It's very much like Satan to infiltrate a congregation through a human agent, someone who looks and acts the part for some period of time, and then pull them away for the sake of pulling multiple congregants away in the end. It's not unlike him at all. That's actually a very effective way of destroying a church, a local assembly, or a group of believers, is to infiltrate it with an agent who's an unbeliever, and then flip the switch, have them leave, and drag people with them because they've built relationships with people in that church. Does that make sense? It's not unlike Satan to do that at all. Matter of fact, it's a pretty effective way to destroy your enemy. You go from the inside. Remember, Satan plays the long game. As an analogy, I think of church infiltration, a little bit like surgical tape. I always get the jeebies. Surgical tape. The prospect of having surgical tape on a part of our body that has any hair on it is scary. <laughs> all right? It's all fine until it must come off. And you just like stand there and go, oh, it's going to hurt. Satan's agents are like that. When they leave, they tend to pull others with them. And it's painful to watch, especially as a pastor. Right? Send a human being into an organization. They have a certain stickiness, especially if they've got a, at least a decent personality, right? They have a certain stickiness to them. And when they leave, it's like people say, oh, well, they're a pretty swell guy or a pretty swell gal. I'm going to listen to them. Why did they leave? Oh, they're saying that that's, oh, that's not true? Oh, there's, a, there's another gospel? That church had Jesus all wrong? The gospel they're talking about sounds like a, sounds like a lot more fun. That's how it works. Satan plays the long game. Always remember that. Again, the principle, beware of those who claim to have found, quote, better news than the one Jesus preached. It's very much like Satan to infiltrate a congregation through a human agent, someone who looks and acts the part for a time, and then pull them away for the sake of pulling multiple congregants away in the end. All right, back to our passage. Go to Hebrews 6.4. Hebrews 6.4. So what's the Spirit saying here? It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, verse 6, to restore them. Some other stuff we have to study, but as we noted last time, the Greek word for taste is guamai, means to taste or experience. So we ended last time with the statement, the who here in context is someone who has experienced firsthand the heavenly gift, a.k.a. the indescribable gift, a la 2 Corinthians 9.15. That's the who here. Someone who's had some experience with this heavenly gift, this gospel message, has heard it, had no sense of, I don't know, or had full sense of, if you will, clarity. It wasn't that the gospel was wrongly stated or anything like that. They were, they, were in the, they were in the light. They tasted it. I was thinking about ancient times for a moment when Jesus himself walked the earth. And don't ever underestimate the power of the Lord's presence in this world. Can you imagine having Jesus Christ standing before you? The fact that we humans didn't esteem him isn't the point. There's nothing more powerful than the Word of God. The Logos, as we know, is Jesus. So the scene is Jesus, the very manifestation of grace and truth, condescended to, to earth from heaven, 
And remember, this is the light of men, mind you. He brings that light of truth with him. He's the very manifestation of light. So if you're standing in front of him, you are standing in front, literally in the presence of the light. Does it get any sweeter than that or effective than that? Most people reject him, call him crazy, and then the extremists who stood to lose the most murdered him. So my point is that we shouldn't be surprised when we give someone the word of God today and they reject it. If they can reject the living manifestation of God's word while he is standing in the flesh before them, what's it for someone to reject his written word today? My point is that we must keep an eye on the simple fact that the human flesh's arrogance is so strong that it rejects the light himself. I was thinking about, I was listening to a message from uh, the late R.C. Sproul, some of you know who he is, the other day, and he said something pretty funny. And this, this makes sense when you think about the level of arrogance that human beings have. He was quoting John Calvin, who I, don't, I never read this from him, but who apparently once said, human babies are as depraved as rats. Now, how popular do you think that's going to be? Human babies are depraved as rats. May not, may not be the most tactful thing for me to go up to Nicole after and say, you know, your kids are like rats. They're more depraved than rats. I'm just, they're cute, but just throwing it out there. You don't want to pick your battles, right? And of course, you know, Calvin, I guess, got a bunch of grief for saying that. And then Sproul turns around and said, Calvin failed to do justice to the rat. Saying human babies are as depraved as rats is an insult to the rats. And you know what? I agree with him. What did the rats ever do? Are the rats responsible for the fall of an entire race? Are the rats the ones who are trying to be arrogant against God? Or are the rats just trying to get along in a world that got screwed up by us? Who's worse in that equation? Oh, but the rats poop. Oh, give them a toilet and train them. Maybe they wouldn't. I'm just throwing them out there. They're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. Fair enough? If you read this week's blog, I sort of alluded to this. Another excerpt from Mama and her ten chicks. It's hard to begrudge innocent creatures, especially when you realize they are just trying to get along in this world like the rest of us. And furthermore, as a friendly reminder to myself, it was my relatives who caused them all the discord, pain, and suffering they currently endure. Again, the point the Spirit's making here is that human arrogance is so strong and sticky that it can and does routinely reject the truth of light. It's utterly disgusting. You have the light of men come down, condescend from perfection, from a perfect environment, condescend to become like one of us, and what do we do with them? We reject them. That's, un that's disgusting. The most invaluable, most unbelievable, indescribable gift is given to mankind, and mankind murders them, crushes it, kills it. What? That's human arrogance. That's how strong it is. The light of men came in the flesh, so here I am, and they killed him. You give someone the light of truth, and what do they do? Throw it in the garbage. Keep it. Keep it. I've heard it before. Run along. I'm doing just fine. Did you see my Corvette? What do I need the Lord for? I'm doing great. I'm pretty righteous, too. 
Just ask my friends over here. It's disgusting. Like it's, it's utterly disgusting. It's like having the Hope Diamond next to a turd, right? And choosing the turd. And even that doesn't do it justice. The most severe culmination of this truth was made evident 2,000 years ago on a cross. So we shouldn't be surprised by the audacity of an evil heart. All right. Got some extra time. Let's see if we can tackle one more descriptor from our list of five before we close. Go to Hebrews 6, 4 again. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So next we have what we might, or what might be, at least as I'm studying this thing out, as I've studied it many times in the past, might be the most difficult of the five listed to interpret. Because it implies a greater understanding of Holy Scripture. I call that you know, plenary. In other words, the whole of it. Which happens often. You're going to read any verse in Holy Scripture. You want to read it in light of the rest of Holy Scripture. That's what plenary Holy Scripture means. Right? Things have to fit. You can't, you can't interpret something here. And then, you know, three chapters later, interpret something that's antagonistic to what you just think you learned here. They have to somehow jive. Right? This is one of those where you have to have a broad understanding, lest you fall into a trap. Like at the outset here I gave you, right? People thinking, oh, everybody gets saved in the end, or, you know, a believer can lose their salvation, this kind of garbage. If you know anything about plenary Holy Scripture... You know that eternal security is a doctrine that we can cling to. In other words, once saved, always saved. If you're truly saved, then you're saved. Right? So, we have arguably one of the most difficult to interpret. We note that this who has, quote, shared in the Holy Spirit. Now, as is the case with most of Holy Scripture, again, the correct interpretation pivots on the verb. Okay, As a little side note, I think I've taught you this in the past, that we typically get the most mileage out of studying the verbs in the Bible versus, say, just the nouns. It's fine to understand the nouns, but we get most of our interpretive skills, if you would, or interpretation from the verbs. Those are the actions in the Bible. So, let's just quickly take a closer look at the Greek word for shared. First, let me give you another translation that is a little more literal to the original language here. Hebrews 6, 4 in the ASV, the American Standard Version. Quote, we're made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Okay? In the ESV it says shared in. But made partakers is a little closer because we actually have two Greek words underneath all this. Ginomai and metakos. Ginomai means to become. Metakos means a sharer, partner, or associate. Okay? Hence the ASV translation. So it's a little bit more expanded, a little more literal in the ASV than it is in the ESV. So, what we have here is a type of very real relationship. To become a sharer, partner, or associate with. So somehow... Two parties are coming together. The subject of the sentence, right, and then the verb is bring these two together with the Spirit. Bring this person together with the Spirit. Okay? Again, we're trying to describe an apostate. So at some point in apostate's life, they come together in this way with the Spirit. So they've been enlightened, they taste the truth, and now they've got the Spirit right next to them. Okay? So what we have here is a very real relationship. I think that's the best way to think about what the writer is saying here. Yes, a believer is indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit, after salvation. That's not what's being said here. 
There's no implication of indwelling. That's unique to we believers as we know. But we cannot make the mistake of thinking that unbelievers don't have a relationship to the Spirit. That would be a mistake. It's not like there's, you know, the unbelievers are over there and the Spirit has no relationship to them whatsoever. That he only focuses on believers once saved and all that kind of stuff. That's not true. The Holy Spirit is ever-present. Just think about the restraining ministry, for starters, of the Holy Spirit in this world as it functions daily to keep this world from essentially imploding upon itself. There's a restraining ministry. In other words, the Spirit only lets things go so far. Well, this world that's being restrained is filled with, guess what? Mostly unbelievers. So whether they know it or not, every person on this earth is affected by God the Holy Spirit. Even as an individual. Okay. In this most rudimentary sense, all humans have a relationship with the Spirit. Furthermore, that relationship extends beyond just a restraining ministry. In fact, the Bible clearly teaches that the Spirit relates to unbelievers directly on multiple fronts. For example, when John wrote about the end times, he makes a reference to the Spirit's relationship to unbelievers. Go to John 16, 7. John 16, 7. So we shouldn't be afraid to believe that the Spirit has a relationship, a personal relationship with unbelievers. Is it the same one we have? Of course not. He doesn't indwell unbelievers. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't have some form of relationship with unbelievers, right? 16, 7, John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I... Go not away, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit is in view, will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him unto you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Right? Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So those are unbelievers even in view. And the Holy Spirit will convict them of these things. You can't convict somebody of something if you don't have a relationship with them. What John wrote is that the Spirit will work with even unbelievers at a very personal level. Right? Consider also the fact that the Spirit must work in the soul of anyone who may ultimately believe. That's interesting, too. Now, I'm going to be honest here because we're getting into that area of supernatural goings-on regarding conversion or non-conversion of. Human beings become, uh, uh, as they relate to God the Holy Spirit, specifically whether or not he's dealing with his elect or non-elect and all that good stuff. I don't have all the details on that. I just know the outcome. I know what the good news is. I know that people have to be born again. And I know, those, I know that those people are called elect. That's what I do know. How all the other stuff happens between God the Holy Spirit and a believer and unbeliever, that's between them and the Lord. That is not my business. There have been way too, as I've taught, I'm not going to go down this rat hole again. There have been way too many well-intentioned theologians that have tried to explain this ad nauseum that have basically butchered the entire thing and confused a lot of people. Just have faith. What I can see in the Bible is that the Spirit's ministry is front and center on salvation issues. Would you agree with that? 
And so ultimately, people fall on one of two sides. Either he empowers their salvation, or he can, quote, convicts the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, a la John 16, 8. We know the outcomes. Some people are saved, some people aren't. And we know that God the Holy Spirit was involved in all of it. He saved some. He was empower- He's the one who empowered that. He baptizes us into union with Christ. But then, for those that aren't saved, he convicts them of their sin. So he has a relationship with both sides. One is very special and fruitful and heavenly. The other one, not so. How he decides, when he decides, who, what people are thinking as they're choosing one side or the other, that's between them and the Lord. I'm not going to do you that disservice. I promise. I'm done with that crap. You just have faith that that's how it works, that God the Holy Spirit has a relationship with every human being that has ever lived. And they're either saved through him or convicted by him. That's the outcome. Again, the Holy Spirit has a relationship with every last person that's ever lived, for better or for worse. Hope that makes sense. That's what I know to be true from the Bible. So let's take that thought back to our passage before I close. Hebrews 6.4. Hebrews 6.4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared, a.k.a. become associated with, in the Holy Spirit. Somehow they ran right up against the Holy Spirit. He was right there front and center. And ultimately they walked away. In light of plenary Holy Scripture, we must conclude that this, quote, sharing, while certainly real and personal, isn't a post-saving faith sharing. It isn't a post-saving faith sharing. Sharing. In other words, the Holy Spirit's personal relationship with unbelievers is not the same as it is with believers. It can't be. It cannot be. Otherwise, we'd be venturing into the land of a believer can lose their salvation and would end up, or upend, I should say, the entire doctrine of eternal security, which flies in the face of the rest of Scripture. So this kind of sharing cannot be a salvific, saving faith, post-salvation type of sharing. If it were, it would imply that people could lose their salvation, and the rest of Holy Scripture is dogmatic against that. So that's where understanding the rest of Holy Scripture helps guide us in our interpretation. Right? Understanding what the rest of the Bible says about a true believer in Christ. They are saved. They are baptized into union with Christ. They are indwelt by the Trinity. Nowhere in Holy Scripture does it say that that can all go away. That God will unsave you. Unindwell you. Leave you be. Nowhere in Holy Scripture is that ever stated. Hence the idea or the doctrine of eternal security. If you are truly saved, not just professing it, coming to church for six months or a year, getting baptized, going through all the motions, looking the part. If you are truly saved, then you will always be saved. What this writer is getting at is there are people that come to churches that aren't saved, that taste it, enlighten it, you know, or associate, hear the Spirit, Whatever that conviction, that convicting ministry looks like between them and the Spirit goes through all that stuff and then says, nope, I'm out. That's who the writer's talking about. It cannot be somebody who's saved. 
Make sense? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for truth that sets us free. Thank you for this time this morning, this time of fellowship with you, with the Word, with the washing of your Word. We just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, to our families, and your will be done to a world that needs the truth so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen.